Hello everyone, Simon here. Um, welcome to another special episode of Philosophy Takes on the News. Um, I've been away for a little while. That's not because I don't love philosophy and I don't love the news and I don't love you. Uh, it's just because I've been very busy. Um, one of the things I've been busy doing is organising a big uh, event on philosophy and comedy, which we held recently. Um, lots of philosophers and comedians and other people came together to discuss all sorts of interesting issues, some of which are very timely, some of which are long-standing. Um, during that event, we had lots of debates and talks, uh, some comedy performances, and one thing we did was have a Q&A panel uh, where we had some comedians and a philosopher um, talking through some of the issues we discussed already at the conference, um, and we decided to record it. So you're going to hear um, three comedians on the panel, Daphne Baram, um, Alexis Dubas and Andy White and then Julian Dodd who's a philosopher at the University of Leeds uh, plus me chairing and then lots of interesting questions and discussion from the floor lots of comedians such as Robin Ince, Rosie Wilby uh, and other philosophers such as Lucy O'Brien, Piers Ben, Graham Forbes and quite a few other people as well um, so it goes on for about an hour and a quarter I have edited it a little bit uh, there's no music breaks um, but there are um, various questions. I hope you all enjoy listening to it. I will point out that at some point, some of the language is a little bit fruity and sweary. Um, there's also um, some serious things that we discuss, as you might imagine. We talk about comedy and free speech and comedy offence. So there's mention of um, various people who've been convicted <laughs> uh, for various offences who are comedians or entertainers who've been in the public eye. Um, I hope that won't um, uh, stop you from listening. Also, because we're dealing with a big room and various microphones, um, we did try to work out um, the sound as best we could, and I've edited it as best as I can, uh, but you'll find that some of the sound dips in and out every so often. I hope that doesn't spoil your enjoyment either. Anyway, here we go. Uh, you'll hear crowd noise at the start, and then we'll introduce the panel, and then we'll be off with our discussions. <laughs> How excited is everyone? Crapter! <laughs> <laughs> right, so we better introduce everyone who's going to be on the panel. We have got these mics here panel as well as these things here. So uh, nice to be with you. I'm Simon Kvirchin as always. We also have on my immediate right. Oh, I thought you were doing the intro. Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Daphne went straight for the crotch grab from the uh, mic on Andy White's lap. Um, so Alexis Dubas, hello. Uh, sometimes known as Marcel Lucon. Um, and a few other guys is, but uh, yeah, stand up and character comedian. Hello, my name's Andy White. That's uh, all I'm known as, and I am also a comedian. Hi, I'm Daphne Baram. I'm also a comedian. I'm also a PhD researcher at Lancaster University. I'm writing about immigrant stand-up comedians. I'm Julian Dodd, and I'm just a philosopher. Oh, I'm the philosopher. Oh. Uh, right, thanks uh, everyone for being here and for the panel uh, taking this on. So this is um, the Philosophy and Comedy Conference we've been having at the University of Kent and a range of events we've organised over the last few years thinking about um, philosophical questions and other questions about comedy. And we've had a few sessions already and I thought it might be good just to raise some of the questions we've had, that people have had in their talks and debates and also we've had from the, from the floor. So we had a, a starting uh, session on comedy and, and free speech. Uh, there was nearly a punch up. Um, but, uh, do, I mean, do you think co comedians can joke about anything they want to? What does the panel think, if anything? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a short answer for a change. Uh, yeah, I think comedians can uh, joke about everything they want to, but it's their attitude and where they're coming from at the subject that 
uh, would determine the legitimacy uh, with which the audience accepts it. So, uh, you know, a lot of you only ever hear people saying, oh, why can't we just discuss race? Discuss race means why can't I just be racist on stage? So I think the question is not what you can discuss and not whether you can make jokes about rape or about Holocaust uh, or about racism, but how do you put them? Who's at the back of them? Uh, I don't uh, want to sound naff, but it is at the end of the day about whether you're punching up or punching down or punching sideways. Anyone else? Yeah, theoretically, you can uh, joke about anything. But I think the more interesting question is, what are the practical constraints upon that and what have people experienced? in relation to that. Um, you know, I've, we've had, I've had practical constraints in relation to uh, what I can say. For instance, I do a wide variety of gigs. There were certain things I would say in front of a group of stags and hens that I would not say at a children's comedy afternoon. And you should try it. You should try I'm it and see try. how it goes. Well, it's, it's, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny you mention that because um, I... At my son's school, I do an after-school uh, comedy club, and it's for 11 to 13-year-olds. And I think, well, I've got, to keep, I've got to tone it down. And then one of them came out with a joke to me that they've been using in the playground. It's, um, um, how do non-binary ninjas kill people? They slash them. <laughs> <laughs> this is brilliant, isn't it? And they're telling this in the playground. So there's, there's all sorts of nonsense about, oh, we must protect children's innocence. It's gonna, they're gonna, their brains will be frazzled. And they know about these things and they're able to come out with brilliant jokes like that, which is, is amazing to me. Um, but, but also, um, usually this question is raised in relation to, um, oh, you can't say anything these days that's offensive. And it's usually made against people from a woke perspective or you can't say anything that's not woke these days and uh, I don't know what anybody else's experience was but I remember immediately after the Queen's funeral oh boy there were a lot of things you couldn't say then in fact I, I did a gig in uh, in Dorking at the Screaming Blue Murder gig in Dorking at the uh, theatre there and it's a council-run venue and they were told what well, we're gonna have the gig go ahead but it can only go ahead on the proviso that nobody says anything about the Queen's passing. Not, not, not even jokes, not allowed to even mention it. So, you know, constraints can go in, in, in various ways. And um, also, I, uh, I don't know if anybody else had the experience of doing, um, doing cruise ships. You've done cruise ships. You did one last, last month for the you, first time. You did one last month, yes. Uh, Yes, I, I did one a few years ago for the first and last time. Know what you're And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and yes, I did find what I said offensive, even though I was trying to tone it down. And I thought to myself, this, this uh, cruise ship I was on, was, you know, it was three times the size of the Titanic. So uh, technically, I was less popular than an iceberg. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but that's all I've, I've got to say on that. Uh, thank you, the imagery. Um, and you've brought back yeah, the imagery of the cruise ship gig idea, which I will not talk about. Um, but yeah, I remember yeah, the, the, the night of the Queen, well, yeah, the Queen died in the afternoon, I believe, didn't she? Or it was announced in the afternoon. That evening I was doing a, a posh gig in Gloucestershire. I was hosting a cabaret night where, uh, again, we were told very much not to... Uh, to reference that and a magician was one of the acts on who um came on and uh, uh, uh as part of his act burned a 20 pound note uh, or supposedly and there's no way i was not letting that slide burning an effigy of the queen at a gig where we were not allowed to mention it how was i how could i not so uh, and it, it went down as well as you might expect um Magician got away with it. I didn't for mentioning it. But um, yeah, comedians can and do say anything they want. I take umbrage with the with with the nights that are supposedly the anti woke nights of sort of going that you 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 know these these are the, the people saying the things that you you can't say. And and I've seen sort of sets from those nights, and 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 they're actually like there's a lot of comedians on there that regularly play the circuit and sort of 
pretty much do that anyway on the circuit, thereby negating, not only negating the premise of the night, but also it, it appear, it's losing its shock value by doing it at that night. Whereas, you know, what they do in a, on a regular comedy night, they, they will do almost the same set and, get, and elicit much more of a shock value, but not still not be cancelled from those nights. So anyway, that's my two pennies worth on that. Thanks, Lexi. I have to say, Andy, that uh, joke from your kids' school, that's probably the funniest thing I've heard all weekend. Uh, Julian. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess we need to um, distinguish, as it were, the question of can you actually do certain material in certain contexts? You know, <laughs> will, your, you know, will your run be kind of brought to an end? Will you be re-engaged? That kind of question. From the question of whether you ought to, and I think that's the possibly the, mo you know, the more interesting question for uh, a philosopher. And I, I think you're absolutely right, Daphne, that it, it, it depends how the material enters. Well, it depends how the subject enters the material, right? That's the crucial thing. But other things too, it seems to me, that as has come up in, the, uh, in some of the sessions, that you, you have to tailor what you, what you do to the audience, as Andy has pointed out. Um, but also, it seems to, it seems to matter who the teller is. That we you know we tend to think that certain material um, is acceptable to be delivered by, by some people, but not others. We you know we bridle at non-Jews telling Jewish jokes, for example. And it seems quite rightly so. But also, something that's come up is time. Time seems to make a difference. So, you know, I don't think anybody would object to somebody telling a a, you know, a Black Death joke, but you know. A Holocaust joke is a different matter. We're too close to it. That kind of question come, kind of comes up. Is, I mean, I think you can, well, I know actually for a fact that you can tell a Holocaust joke. Uh, but I think, again, as you said, it depends who you are, but it also depends, again, where are you coming from? Are you trying to say something anti-racist, something universal, or are you just trying to, I mean, you know, Adrienne Trusker did a whole show about rape jokes, uh, where she and she was doing it with her uh, whole bottom bit was bare. It was a very unique show uh, in which she was talking about her own experience. It was a funny show, but she kind of came from a place where she was sort of, there was a thing of permission uh, with with comedy. You need to get an inexplicit, but very clear permission from the audience to talk about what you're going to be talking about. And the more you frame in advance who you are, what you're going to say, you sense whether this permission exists. Uh, and the thing, this is why we have in comedy this idea that you have to get it out of the way by explaining who you are. Uh, and this is almost a condition for the audience is going like, oh, oh, okay, I get it. So you're a woman, you're Jewish, you've been raped, whatever. Now you're allowed to tell that joke. And I think that's, that's a big bit of, of the permission that you can get. Thanks, Daphne. And yet, what constitutes the permission of the audience? It's kind of treating the audience as a kind of monolithic thing. I mean, they might not be. So there are kind of, <laughs> there, are, there are difficult questions here, it seems to me, about whether you've got that, that permission of the audience and what would constitute permission. How do you tell that you've got it? Yeah, one of the interesting points raised yesterday, I thought, was um, sort of the difference between people going to see a certain comedian do a tour show and people going along, perhaps blissfully unaware, going to see a, a mixed bill night on the comedy circuit and something... I think that's quite lovely is, is about the local gig is that it's curated, that it's, that it's curated by a promoter, um, especially the more sort of long running gigs and the more, uh, yeah, uh, established gigs. You put trust in that promoter and that venue to provide comics that will not, that, 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 you know, that, that, are, that have craft and that have the, that know what they're doing. And so even if a comedian veers into offensive territory, you know, they won't have booked a Nazi, you know, it will be someone who's going to subvert that, who's going to uh, come at it in an interesting way. Even if it's sort of veering off into offensive territory, you know, there'll be a point in them doing that. You know, that that will be, as I say, a transgressive or subversive thing that they're going to be doing because the, the place that has booked them, you know, knows knows their audience and knows that that act. But also, I think in the case of these sort of veteran local gigs, you also know as a comedian that you are sort of protected. Uh, that in a way, the, the the promoter would not have booked you had he not uh, been sure that you'll come out of that gig 
alive at least, uh, so that they they know that this is kind of your audience. And in this sense, I think these kind of gigs are exactly in the middle between a completely accidental open mic uh, and and between your own one hour that people come to see you because they know who you are, and still sort of the you you've been curated for the audience, but to an extent, the audience has been also curated for you. I think. So I'm looking out at our audience and wondering how monolithic you are. Uh, anyone, anyone got any thoughts or questions before I bring it back to everyone else? Uh, you, young man with a with a nice beard, there. I so so on the th- question of whether the audience is monolithic. I mean, part of what the compare's job is at a, a comedy gig is to create a, the audience as a social entity, as as a group agent. So monolithic, you know, they're not going to be homogenous as it were, but they start acting in concert. Um, and that's one of the skills of the compare to make that happen. But is a really important part of the art form is that you're dealing with a room that acts together. Now there might be sort of different responses within that room, but there's, there's like a mood that you get, that you can exploit. That's part of where the danger comes from, but that's part of where the interest comes from. So the challenge, so as it were, there's an ambiguity in the word audience. There's literally whoever it is that can hear and what with stuff being put on the internet, that could be the entire world. And the audience as the curated group agent that gets created anew each gig um, and goes through this transformation. And I think philosophically, that creation of a group agent is extremely interesting and kind of underappreciated. I think that's the thing we call the room, yeah. uh, which you don't only read, as you know, we like to use this phrase, reading the room, but you also create for yourself, if you can. So basically there's a, a notion of turning the room into, and it's not just the job of the compere, even though he sort of started, but it's also the job of the comedian to do it. And if you manage to do that, then even if you have a position in the room, even if you have a heckler or sometimes a whole table of drunken, you know, stagged or something, you can make the audience your ally in marginalizing them and sometimes even physically getting them out of the room so you can win. That was uh, <clears throat> interesting what you were saying about um, Compass' job to create a, a group. It really reminded me of, uh, I was listening to that uh, Comedians Comedian podcast, uh, Stuart Goldsmith, and Gary Delaney was on there. And it wasn't so much related to comedy. It was, he was talking about Martin Luther King and the beginning of one of his speeches and saying, I know we've got people in from Alabama and the people from Alabama, I know we've got people in from Georgia. He said, he's basically doing crowd work for that and bringing the audience together. And also I say, what, what are you doing? With, 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 you, you, I, I think you've got it spot on what the job of a compare is, but um, having done a lot of mirth control gigs, I think the job of the compare is to be cheap enough so that the headliner gets a bit more money. <laughs> So, uh, well, I don't know how, how cheap I am, but I know I've got someone very expensive in the audience over here. Mr. Robin Inns. The, um, uh, when you were just mentioning Alabama, actually, it made me think of Dick Gregory and talking about a room. Dick Gregory, who, if, if no one's seen it, the documentary about his life or read any of his autobiographies, where one of the things that made his career was he was playing the Playboy Club when uh, it turned out there was a group, a business group from Alabama in, and Hugh Hefner actually said, Dick, I'll pay you your full whack. You don't have to go on. He said, I'm going to go on. And then he, you know, did jokes like, you know, a lot of people say everything's negative about segregation, but, you know, there's positives as well. I mean, whenever, when have you ever read about a bus crash where the people at the back died? You know, and it's like, but that wasn't Dick Gregory's except that. But the thing that I wanted to ask is people are always clamoring to find, because I'll often get people saying, well, of course, comics are being cancelled all the time. And then when you say who, and they'll say, well, like Louis C.K. And you go, that wasn't an onstage issue. Um, but... Jerry Sadovitz, of course, was in, in the Edinburgh Fringe last year. There was a lot of contention about the fact that it was felt that he was cancelled for the gig that he did. And I'm interested in people's opinions on that, because when you were talking about The Room, I think the thing about what happened with Jerry Sadovitz was he was booked for the wrong venue. He played the Edinburgh Conference Centre, where that's a kind of a corporate venue where a lot of the younger people working there 
are suddenly having to watch, as far as they're concerned, without having the context of who Jerry Sadovitz is, he's just a comic that's come in, they're hearing very heated jokes about race, uh, about LGBT people, about women, in a way that if that had been in a normal fringe fringe venue... I don't think that would have become an issue. So I just wondered what you felt about the the Jerry Sadovitz case. Well, Sadovitz, that was a really interesting one, wasn't it, last year? Because he was defended by both the left and the right, which is a really rare case. And it, yeah, it, a lot of it was wrong, wasn't it? I think it was it was the wrong it was the wrong booking in the wrong venue, and he was doing two nights, wasn't he? And was allowed. He did one, and then it was over. The main complaints were over a racial slur. And him getting his knob out, to be fair, I think. Not at the same time. Um, he's, he's a craftsman. Um, but, you know, it was, um, yeah. I think I described him yesterday as almost like the, Brit, the, the, the British prototype shock comic, I suppose. I mean, well, yeah, for, for, for this, for, for sort of the alternative comedy scene as we know it. And... It's really because I don't know whether it was the fault of the venue to not inform the staff about the content that they're, that they're, they're being given. I mean, yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't call that a cancellation. He's now doing a UK tour, I think, isn't he? He's, 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 he's gained a new audience. Maybe not the audience that he sort of wanted to gain, but he's gained, I think he's definitely gained a new audience from it. And it's, interestingly, it's the whole idea of a safe space, and it's a, isn't it that we're sort of talking about here? The safe space for the craft of comedy and for be, for being able to say what you want. And and it's I haven't seen Sadowitz for a few years, so, but I know the last time I saw him a few years ago, it was definitely done with a gleeful wink in the eye, a, a, a sparkle in the eye of of. of of like, you know, you know, I don't sort of really believe that we're all enjoying the shock value of this. And God, I'd, I st- yeah, I didn't, I'd, I'd wish I'd seen that show and I wish I'd seen him more recently because some, there were people in the audience who, I know people who did go to see it and said that they actually felt that he changed his tone a little bit and that it did, it did feel nastier and that it did feel um, a bit more shocking for the sake of it without the craft. I don't know if it, did you see the show? No, I, I, yeah, I spoke to a lot of people. I do think there's a thing where the, um, the you're getting to map the audience. Some people were saying to me that they felt, uh, no, 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 I want to be just like a strange ghosty voice. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm interested in, in that idea, which is, if there's a lot of people in Jerry Sadovitz's audience who are genuinely laughing at the race jokes because they like the racism, in, in the same way that Al Murray's pub landlord, when that became really big on an arena scale, no longer was the irony travelling to the back rows. People were cheering. In the, I remember watching Alf Garnet once, and at half an hour into the set, I got the sense that the audience were no longer laughing at Alf, they were laughing with him. And that changes things so much, doesn't it, in terms of when your intention is misinterpreted, do you take that full on or do you go, oh, tell with it, everyone's paid and I'm making more money? Uh, I've seen him two years before that show, okay? And I've seen him loads of times before. Sorry. I just, okay, I've seen him lost a twinkle. This is what I have to say. I've been in a show, I was sitting between two black comics and he was directly attacking him, saying, attacking them without a joke. He was just saying, black people, black people should only ever be slave. This is what black people are good for. Now, there was no tinkle, there was no punchline, there was no irony. He died on his ass. he has to leave the room in disgrace. And then two years later, this Edinburgh thing happened. I think it's been going downhill for a while. And if you use, lose the irony and lose the audience's permission uh, to be racist with the idea that behind it there's some irony, then you're gone. Apollo? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know enough about this. But I mean, what I suspect is that, at least to begin with, if Daphne is right, Jerry Sadowitz was a kind of conceptual artist. You know, so it was about getting us to laugh at this material and then consider why we're laughing and whether we should. Uh, Maybe he's changed, you know, he's changed a bit now. I mean, that does raise a question of of when when audiences misunderstand what people are doing, what artists are doing, to what extent is the the artist responsible? And that's quite a difficult question, which 
well, it's bloody murder, so I'm going to pass the microphone to somebody else. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to say I think that I'm 100% responsible. If you're walking a line, you are responsible for the line being walked, and if you mess it up, it's your mess up. Just saying. Okay, we're going to get some more... Uh, I don't think that's quite right. I mean, I think that we want artists to be walking lines and to be testing boundaries. Um, and, I, and so just saying that if there's a misunderstanding, it's just down to them. I think that's, that's not quite right. Okay, a few more thoughts from the floor. I, would say, um, I, I don't think we're, we're always wanting artists to walk lines. Sometimes people just want to come out just to have a laugh. Just to be, just to be reassured that they're not the only ones, and they're not that, they're not crazy. That yeah, there is somebody who shares my view of the world and is able to put that in an amusing way. I mean, that's why I watch Ted Lasso. It's just just comforting, really. Yeah, but if he suddenly goes all racist, then it's his fault. Yes. I, I agree with you. If you walk in the line, I, I mean, I've I've been on the wrong side of this myself. I've um, written a joke, thought, it's funny, but it might, mm, is it, is it, is it, a, it's a bit dodgy, I don't know. Will the audience just think, oh, he's being cheeky, or will they be offended? And I've said it, and they've gone, no, that's offensive, and I've taken that on the chin, that's me, I don't do that joke again. Or sometimes you try it in Bromley, and then what? <laughs> I have to say, hearing Jerry Sadovitz described as someone who's attacked by both the left and the right gives me the impression that he's like this Blairite centrist. That probably isn't... Probably isn't great, yeah. A uh, few thoughts from the floor. First of all, Ollie. We're just going back to the conceptual artist and really picking up on Robin's point about context. I mean, Jerry Sadovitz's probably all-time career most famous or infamous joke is he, he would say... This is in the mid-1980s... Uh, playing to audiences which were, you know, what we would now call woke or probably politically correct at the time. And his joke was, Nelson Mandela, what a cunt. And then it was, uh, you, you lend somebody a fiver, you never see them again. Now, th that's, the, <laughs> that's, that's the punch, that's the punchline. But Nelson Mandela, what a cunt is a precision joke because it's taking a, a very revered figure and using a word that's totally unacceptable at the time, not just because of the rudeness, because deemed to be, within the feminist culture of the time, deemed to be misogynist. So it's a very clever joke. Um, and allegedly, Nick Revel, another comic, suggested to him as a dare, I bet you wouldn't dare say this. And it precisely picks up on Julian's point about it being, a, in a way, a conceptual artist thing. But the thing is, the problem is, as soon as you take it out of that context, that joke changes its meaning, or it could do. Um, and, you know, in the, along the lines of um, 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 Alf Garnet or whatever. Yeah. So I, I think it, context is hugely important in determining me meaning. That's my point. Thanks. And Rosie will be. Oh, um, yeah. Well, I was just um, reminded when Andy was talking about when we have children at gigs and I see so many comedians go oh my god there are kids here and get into a real flap and panic but then do their normal set anyway and um and the parents start to look nervous but it's usually fine and I was um, doing my show about breakups at a festival where they'd um got a little box where people were putting in their breakup stories and they the winner of the funniest breakup story, which I had to judge very much on the hoof because the people were putting them in during the show was going to win a signed copy of my book. And I was reading this story out and it said, uh, or I thought it said, when I was 61, got divorced. And then it went on. And it turned out that uh, when the winner came up, she was actually a young child. And she was saying, when I was six, I got divorced. And, uh, yeah, she was actually using this very mature language. And I think I think you're right that um, we do get way too nervous about children and what we think will, will be appropriate. Um, and uh, also, I was interested to pick up on what Alexis was saying about um, clubs curating the bill, which obviously, yes, largely that happens. But how how do they do that? you know, without sometimes people who are going to do stuff that falls outside what that club deems suitable, acceptable for their audiences. 
um, because comedians are changing their material all the time. I mean, I gig a lot at a club in South London called the Poodle Club, where Karen, who runs it, has a very specific atmosphere that she's trying to create and curate. Um, Very sort of feminist, inclusive, queer, positive atmosphere. And I have seen her when she's booked a kind of straight guy who's being a bit blokey really pulling faces and looking at me like oh my god you know his video wasn't anything like this um so I'm just wondering how how that is a sort of foolproof method and particularly perhaps with newer acts who are doing you know maybe Karen's giving them a 10 minutes in the middle or something like that where they might come and do something completely different to what the the promoter is expecting so I'm not sure it's 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 completely foolproof and also you know, we can all, um, even those of us like me, I'm I'm guilty of trying to be too ridiculously politically correct and falling over myself to be, and sometimes I lampoon myself for doing so. Um, and, but we can all mess up. Um, you know, even if you're someone like me who p- p- terribly British about and trying to always say the right thing. Um, and I was comparing a cabaret for apples and snakes who are this sort of very kind of right on poetry organization. And I was trying to get everyone corral everyone back into their seats and there was a man who was not looking at me and uh, I was like he's not even looking at me come on now and I did feel mortified a bit later on when he got up with his white stick and uh, he was blind and I was I was sort of then trying to make up for it and sort of you know helping all the disabled people out of the venue but I actually uh, was sort of um, pushing this guy along in his wheelchair and actually ended up wheeling him down the pavement very very fast and trying to hold on to him so I I think I can be too guilty of trying to trying to do and say the right thing um <laughs> you know and we and we all mess up so you know I, I think we we mustn't um, <laughs> try. You know, I think I try too hard to to try and always say the right thing. But what what the hell is it? What the hell is that? And I, yeah, I love the comedians that do push those boundaries. And I suppose sometimes I, because I'm trying so hard to say the right thing, when I say the wrong thing, then it can be. Uh, quite fun and I can make fun of myself and my own ridiculous liberal values um, and how I'm trying too hard uh, to be PC but yeah interesting really interesting thoughts everyone thank you Um, actually we are doing a kids version of this in about two or three months time we're going to get Jerry Sadovitz to headline (laughs) Um, yeah just picking up what Rosie was saying and then something Andy said uh earlier on um when andy said you know he tried a joke it just didn't work moved on i was wondering if you've got any other reflections examples of that where you've kind of thought you know that's a joke that i tried it didn't work and whether it was self-censorship or it was the wrong laugh from the audience something we've talked about thinking about robin about al murray and what sort of example of that and julian have you tried any philosophy material you thought that didn't work i'm just not gonna always a story that I used to tell in a show, uh, and that was about my experience as a human rights lawyer in the West Bank. And it was about, I had, I, one of my first clients was a failing terrorist. And he was, he was just trying to bomb one bus after the other, and nothing happened, nothing exploded. It was a bit shit at what he was doing. Uh, and eventually the, the bomb, it was pre-suicide bombers, the bomb exploded in his hand while he was on a bus on the way to the bus stop that he wanted to explode, and he lost the... It was a bit of a manicure uh, sort of incident, and this is what got him caught. And the story, uh, it's everybody... It, it's quite a long story. I used to tell it as a part of a show or in storytelling gigs, and nobody ever laughed. And I swear to God, it's a funny set, but... People were like, what is going on here? Who's the part of this joke? Is it the terrorist? Is the terrorist the hero of the story? Is this woman, she's Jewish, can she tell this story that is basically making fun of a Palestinian terrorist who's not very good at what he does just because he's not very good? And so the moral ambiguity of the story that was supposed to be the conceptual brilliantness of it, in my opinion, uh, basically made it fail as a comedy. So people would always come at the end of the show and say, wow, this was a brilliant story. This was the best bit of the show and I was like yeah but why weren't you laughing because for comedians the only reward is laughter uh, so if you didn't laugh it means you didn't like it but people were like no we liked it alright but we just did, did, did. 
we didn't know where to laugh. Uh, so I think sometimes, and I reconsidered, I took it off the show and I used to take it to storytelling gigs where you don't have to be funny. Uh, but as comedy, it was just not working. Now I keep thinking, maybe it has to do with my skills. Maybe in five years, I will manage to bring it back and tell it in a way that will be funny. Uh, but I don't know. Can I just say something about offence? I mean, so I mean, a lot of us have been talking about this issue of, of, of what happens when, you know, when we offend people in the audience and, you know, we don't necessarily want to do that. And I wonder whether that's the right touchstone. So, I mean, for me, you know, because people can be offended when they shouldn't be. So it, it, it seems to me that what matters is not whether the material offends people or not, but it's to do with its content. Does it kind of... You know, does it sort of uh, express hatred of or belittle or silence or misrepresent marginalised people? You shouldn't do that, it seems to me. But offensiveness is a very, it seems to me to be a crude measure of whether you're doing that. I think that we just need to focus, I'm not a comedian, we. We need to focus on our material rather than necessarily just thinking always of the effect that it has. And of course, I think we should also realise that sometimes it can be good to be offended. I think that Rebecca was coming to kind of saying something a little bit like that. I mean, it can be the beginning of a process where, you know, you're offended by something and then you go home and then you think, why was I offended by that? And it might actually be the beginning of a process by which something which you thought was wrong or impossible kind of opens up as a possibility for you. I don't think we want to rule that out. Uh, Gabby. Hi. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that's just come to mind is to, to me, it's not just about offence, it's how people respond to things. So I'm part of the Stand Up Comedy Society here. And one of our policies is that whenever we workshop as a group, we always check at the end if there was any sort of dodgy joke like we always check that it landed right in the room and we also do trigger warnings and trigger warnings aren't necessarily about offense but it's about certain topics that might make people feel a certain type of way so I don't just think it's about offense it's about bringing up a certain topic in a certain way that people might not expect and again I think it goes back to what Daphne was saying about the intention behind it because some people are going to get triggered just by the mere mention of something but other people are going to get triggered if it's mentioned in a certain way so I think perhaps it's wrong to focus on offences like this buzzword but I think it's important to think about our intentions and how we make other people feel. Isn't the trigger warning in itself uh, some kind of a focusing on the offence? Because that's that's the idea. If you come in here and you hear this thing, you might be offended. Rather than on, you know, I think it's okay to say we are not a racist and misogynistic comedy club. But I think the trigger warning of a comedy club is at the door of the comedy club. You walked into a comedy club, you might hear things that you don't like saying. Uh, I mean, and I know that I'm exposing my age here, but I also think if you're in the world, there are going to be things that you're not going to like and your way to combat them is to use speech against speech. Uh, so uh, I know it's a bit old-fashioned, but uh, as, as a woke comedian, maybe I can say that. Uh, I'm going to move us on to a, a different question. So uh, yesterday we had a session from Julian Bagini, uh, who isn't here. He had to uh, uh, go back home because he's terrible at managing his diary. And he gave uh, a talk, which is basically... It, is comedy a form of philosophy? And he was trying to motivate the idea that it was, and he had a range of examples, many from The Simpsons. I'm just thinking, you know, any reflections on on that from people? So is comedy a form of philosophy? Do you think that, I mean, obviously it's, it's different. You, you might be doing some different things, trying to get a laugh rather than, but is there some kind of connection between, you know, philosophers trying to reflect on things and trying to bring things out and get us to see things in a certain way and what, comedians are doing any thoughts on that one well um thinking about the uh, you know socratic dialogues and that there was a, that was a sort of form of uh stand-up comedy it, it's something i that that style of things is something i try to bring into my particularly when i'm comparing and i'm talking with somebody and then that they'll say something and then i'll try and find something uh ridiculous in what they say I was, I, recently I was uh, doing a gig up north somewhere, Darlington it was, anyway, Darlington, and I was doing my my thing, 
And somebody shouts out, nothing you've said is funny. <laughs> so, so I thought, well, I'll, so I'll, I'll do a bit of Socrates here then. Okay. <laughs> so, so, I was just like, okay, it's not funny. Um, well, what, would you, what would you rather I talk about? It says, well, why don't you talk about something sensible? And I said, yes, because that's exactly why we come to a comedy night to talk about things that are sensible. There's a woman here who works in HR. Perhaps she can talk a little bit about the sexual harassment policy. We know we're going to go on insurance. Perhaps we can talk about an insurance policy for you, sir, because I think you need it. So to, to do that sort of Socratic method on that sort of has, uh, has, has helped me out. Perhaps, perhaps it was one of the more useful things I learned from studying philosophy. But, but yeah, it is it's a form of philosophy because you do, you, you're sort of looking at things and, and picking apart the assumptions of things. I, I remember when I was first reading about them, uh, Bertrand Russell talked about the difference between the, the logical form of a sentence and the grammatical form of a sentence. And, and you look through the assumptions that are in a sentence and analyze them. And it reminded me of, uh, there's a book, comedy writing book by a guy, Greg Dean, which a lot of uh, stand-ups uh, first uh, practice on. And he does that, he says, right, well, here's a sentence. What are the assumptions behind this sentence? How can you um, explode them or look at this sentence in a different way? So, so yeah, it is, it is a, it's a form of philosophy in that sense. Well, stand-up's sort of the combination of the, like, Nietzsche's, Dionysian and Apollo, isn't it? It's basically, it's the thought and then the chaos all combined. It, you know, you're, it's it, the jester that is also sort of posing as, almost posing as the king, I suppose. So you've got that lovely dichotomy that you get in a, in a lot of sort of, I suppose, like um, Western philosophy and a lot of moral philosophy of the... Yeah, the the comedian acting as the fool, but actually being the one that guides us uh, through life. Any thoughts or questions? Lucy O'Brien. Um, so I'm going to just say a really boring thing to start with, which is... <laughs> no, 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 it is. It's a classic kind of... So, you know, is X a form of Ying? That's the form of our question. And comedy is, it's a bit like sort of saying, is music a form of philosophy? They're just comedy is a, is a huge variety of human activity. I mean, I'm not quite sure how one would define comedy. Similarly, I'm not sure philosophizing has very, very many different forms. So I think it's just clear that comedy is very rarely a form of developing a modal logic, <laughs> right? So there are just, there are things that philosophers do um, that, <laughs> that just aren't going to be reached. But, so I think our, our question is really, and, and it's also a kind of form of, there's a philosopher's tendency that I obviously have also fallen to, but that, that we're going to make everything what we're doing and we should need to there are some forms of comedy that are just not they're political agitation i mean of course some people think philosophy is now also political agitation but but um so i think there's lots of comedy that is not philosophizing so you know, our question is are there forms of comedy and alexis might be right there are forms of comedy that are enactments in some way of philosophical thinking but we shouldn't make all comedians Type philosophy. I think as the centers we try to create this uh, structure. I said yesterday after that talk that um, there is uh, it's a, it's a comedic like like Andy said we have this structure of polemic in comedy where we put on an argument and attack it. So you can see it in uh, as I said yesterday in CK's uh, uh, of course, but maybe uh, you can see it in other things that he did. You can see it. Um, Ed Byrne did a thing where he was arguing with uh, the famous philosopher Alanis Morissette about 
her song ironic, but the structure of how he made that polemic is very philosophical in its logicality. I mean, I, I used to do a, a, a bit after that terrorist story of arguing with the idea of excellence in society. Like we want everybody to be the best at what they're doing. Do we really want our terrorists to be the best at what they're doing? Uh, and it was a, it turned into a whole political thing. But we, we do use the structures and sometimes we use them to argue an argument. But I really think that to answer that question or to ask that question, uh, really, you need to define more narrowly and accurately what philosophy is. And then we can probably answer that. Not going to do that. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I just, I guess, um, what one might try and come at this from thinking about what the point of the activities are. So if you think of philosophy as it, as Julian seemed to, as about establishing distinctly philosophical theses by argument, um, then it, it looks pretty difficult that, that comedy could be good philosophy. Because one might worry, you know, one might worry that, as it were, the the structure of the argument is somewhat um, uh, uh, occluded by the amusingness. Um, so you know, probably Paul Whitehouse could argue for anything, and I just want to go. Oh, I just want to cheer. But it might be that you know the arguments aren't very good, right? If you've got a slightly different view of philosophy, then you know, then then maybe. Um, I mean, no doubt that there are. There, you know, there can be interesting relationships between them. You know, you, you know, you know what you said, Daphne, about you know, kind of, you know, using certain certain techniques that one might see in philosophy, for example. But uh, there'll be a kind of traditional philosopher who will bridle at the idea that what you're, you know, what philosophers do is attack uh, a thesis as if the point of it is to destroy it as it were, by whatever polemical or rhetorical means possible. Well, most philosophers will want to distance themselves from that. Great, thank and you. Humour can be used in polemic, of course, extremely effectively. So like Plato was worried about art and poetry and what have you. Without, without being too reductionist, are you actually saying uh, um, comedians are not clever enough to make a, a, a philosophical argument? Oh, God, no. I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't, no, no, there are some, I mean, you're all really clever and there are some philosophers who are really not, um, but, but it's just different. different. Is the tradition of philosophy to look at, I don't know, Diogenes fishing or whatever it was and kind of going, this is what it is, the essence is right. from the simple uh, gesture, really? Or... Yeah. So it seems to me that, yeah, it, as you yourself said, I think it kind of depends on how one is thinking of philosophy. And the way that Julian was thinking of it, 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 it does make it hard, I think, you know, to see how comedy could be good philosophy. But if you think of philosophy as involving stuff like getting us to see the significance of things, describing things in just the right way to make them familiar to us, you know, then it seems more likely that, that comedy, it seems more likely to me, that comedy could be good philosophy. Uh, Graham. Excellent. So... I take it one of the interesting things about the question, um, can comedy be philosophy, is, as it were, there might be a distinctive way in which comedy can be philosophy in that publishing journal articles in mind, though a thing that many of us would like to do, is, you know, is not going to be able to achieve. Mind is not the venue for this, but a stage in a stand-up club might be. And I actually want to discuss one of my new favourite acts, um, Billy Goldfin. Um, because I think we saw something distinctly philosophical about um, a goldfish who couldn't remember enough to get to the punchlines, but the punchlines landed some. There. And I, I genuinely think there, there was an interesting point about language, like a, a philosophical point about the nature of language that was being made with that set. So I was wondering if, if anybody has any comments on uh, the work of um, Go Mr. Goldfin. I don't know why you're handing the mic to me. Um, it's uh, it's Bobby Goldfin, by the way. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, that's just. I mean, that's just a really simple. It's just a really simple premise of, of putting on a goldfish head and and, and doing yeah the the setups, but not the punchlines. But yeah, it does. But it's but, a lot funnier than Alexis has just described. <laughs> but um, 
you know, like the the best, all the best comedy is oh, is is people suddenly being being forced to laugh. Oh, I, I've never thought of it like that before, or even that you 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 have thought of it, but you didn't realise that you that you thought of it like that before. Um, and the uh, yeah, so um, the whole goldfish ruse. It's just a really simple gag stretched out for as long as I can. <laughs> I've done about five or six minutes before. It's really excruciating, um, but for everyone, but. Yeah, it's but again, that just it just takes that just just takes a really simple notion of oh, we know goldfish have a two second memory, but it and it and it makes it it makes it flesh. Uh, oh, sorry, we got someone. I'll keep going. And so I've never had that as a heckle before. Um, so so <laughs> um, through me. Uh, so yeah, it's just it's a, it's a really simple and we and we it's a one joke thing. But it's the for that for me it's it's the it's the agony of seeing it played out like for as for as long as we feel we 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 inhabit the golf it's it's Nagel's what you know is, is it what is it to be a bat it's, it's yeah so it's there we go well it's 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 oh god a, a interspecies uh, comedy club you know going on here and we don't under, and and there's a lack of understanding going but there is an understanding so yeah that's the joy there. But my question is, why are we looking at comedy as good philosophy? Why why can't we just have an idea of comedy having any opportunity to, to be philosophical? Because I'm a student here, I'm doing a philosophy degree, but when I go out to a comedy night, I'm not thinking, hmm, I wonder what they've got to say as philosophers. I'm just thinking, let's have a good comedy night. And if they say something philosophical, great, that will get me thinking. But why are we immediately trying to compare the two disciplines? Actually, that is lovely. The comedian is a bad philosopher. Yeah. You should not be following this person's uh, raison d'etre. Absolutely not. So it's the joy of that. It's and, and uh, you know, like f- philosophy is seen as being quite inaccessible, I think, to most people. But uh, the comedy club, is, the comedy stand up, is is the most accessible form of comedy. Really, usually it's typically just one person and a mic and um, a very direct communication with with, with an audience. Try, yeah, it's play. Yeah, so it's yeah, in a way, it's playing at being a philosopher, but 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 sort of yeah, in no way wanting people to, to to live by their their edicts or their or their kind of their way of life their view of life yeah so thanks i mean um the the reason for my asking that question was you know if, if you ask you know is is comedy a form of philosophy but it can only be a form of yeah kind of not very good philosophy that's that's kind of bad news for comedy whereas what i think is that comedy is what it is that we shouldn't necessarily think that we've got to in some sense justify it by saying it's a form of anything else but we can ask big questions i think that's if that is what philosophy is about can we ask big questions yes we ask big questions and we try to provide answers and some of the answers are rubbish and some of these answers are actually not very bad i mean this is the thing with this format you just stand on a stage and you can do everything for a certain amount of minutes there was a comedian who used to do this social experiment where he would ask the audience to throw shoes at him i can't remember his name in phil k it's Phil Kay, I think. No, 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 no. Oh. Uh, God, I'll remember in a minute. Anyway, he <laughs> was doing that. It was everybody take their shoes off. Everybody hold your shoe in your left hand, throw it at me. And I was, so at first, and he was just standing there for a long time, and then suddenly one person threw a shoe. And a minute later, everybody did. So everybody was waiting for the, fr- and I thought that is a brilliant sociological experiment with philosophical, far reaching consequences. And all he did was just stand there and go, oh, throw your shoes at me. So, you know, you can, you can raise important ideas and questions with that. I know Phil K has been banned from a couple of venues for doing that. He did it. It was a kid. It was a kids show was, uh, where they had to, they, the kids have the kids have to win back their left shoe by doing whatever by doing what and and it's um uh, yeah it's quite joyous and he but he's, yeah there was a couple of times where he didn't tell the venue and lights got smashed and invites were not resent. No, he didn't. No, he remained closed for that. Yeah. So so I just want to go to back to Gabby's question. So I was the one who said, don't ask, you know, are they the same thing or whatever, but ask and said whether there are some instances of comedy that's philosophizing. So so I do, a couple of things I think we've missed. One of the things about Julian's point was that it 
comedy is clearly like incredibly effective critique. So I have a colleague who says, Lucy, the aim of philosophy is to push back the borders of ignorance, mm -hmm. right? Just realize more and more what we don't know. And comedians clearly push back the borders of ignorance. You know, like take a thesis, pull it apart, and you realize it's sort of, the, so the doubt seeds, you know, sowers and things like that. So that, that's the Andy's point about the Socratic dialogue aspect which is why people hated Socrates, apparently. But um, <laughs> but the other thing I, that's more like, well, why should we ask the question other than the fact that we're just all in the same room? Like, why are we all in the same room? There aren't that many, like, activities that are kind of pointless, mm -hmm. right, in the, in the sense in which we set aims. We're not, you know, that are sort of, like if we were debating what policy to have about, you know, university buildings, then we'd know what the... There's no practical upshot of either philosophy or comedy. But nevertheless, it, so its value is like intrinsic to the activity itself. And it's a form of self-reflection in almost all cases. And it's... it's it's into it, it's it value is in the intellectual pleasure of human thought, and there aren't that many things that's just true of. You know, there is pleasure in science, and there is pleasure in political science, and there is, but like, how many other people just like live off the permutations and combinations of their own mind doing its shit? <laughs> Philosophers and comedians, like, <laughs> got another thought. Or question over here. Piers Ben. <clears throat> yes, another philosopher. Huh. Well, after a fashion. Yeah, I, I uh, was prompted by Julian Bergini's thought yesterday to think about the relationship, if there is one, between philosophy and comedy. And some of Julian's ideas were, uh, were quite um, relevant because he was talking about Monty Python and, and talking about how they uh, gave comedic expression to ideas of the ultimate pointlessness and meaninglessness and absurdity of human life. And if you think that's the case, that human life is meaningless in the simple sense that it's, there's no d guiding plan or ultimate purpose behind it, then you can resort to comedy um, as much as you can resort to gloomy existentialism uh, about these matters. So Julian showed that comedy certainly has a way of getting to the heart of things when philosophy might, uh, with the same questions, be engaging in pedantry and distraction and word games and a lot or a lot of the pompous nonsense that constitutes philosophy nowadays or some of it so comedy has a way of, cl of cutting through pomposity pedantry and all this sort of stuff but there's also a disadvantage of that because comedy and philosophy are doing different things if you go to um, a sort of com your favorite comedian who reinforces your beliefs and gives a sort of satiric, witty account of how stupid people are who disagree with you, you go away feeling good because you see the, the comedian's punctured this argument. She's punctured that argument. So that proves how clever I am because my, my opponents have now been shown to be really stupid. So you, you go away with this good feeling. And you, might, you can imagine sort of a new atheist comic, for example, to take an example at random, would sort of do a Voltaire act you know, puncturing this argument for God's sake, or isn't this account of a miracle really stupid? And, and you could go away feeling good about that. The trouble is that some, imagine some sort of really philosophical evangelical Christian is in the audience with all the tools of analytic philosophy and says, yes, that's all quite funny, but it completely misses the point because what about Plantinga's third argument about the second response to the modal argument for the ontological? But he hasn't mentioned that. And since he hasn't mentioned that, his whole conclusion collapses. So you can laugh, but you're laughing in a delusional bubble because you think your views have been proven, and they haven't been. They're just as false as they ever were and indeed always will be. Now, this is the problem because if you do philosophy, you have to do it well. A lot of philosophy is badly done. Um, a lot of philosophy um, argues for dubious conclusions. I mean, but some of it is actually, you know, probably very rigorous. There are, I mean, two examples which are were known to insiders are David Lewis. Uh, who argued that there really are possible worlds. They actually exist. It sounds a counterintuitive view, but there are arguments for it. Derek Parfit thinks there's no such thing as a self. You know, um, he follows Hume. Again, totally counterintuitive. Easy, see how it might be mocked on stage. 
uh, well, there's no such thing as self, really. so who are you talking to then? You know, can you imagine how some joke, but the parfait was way with that misses the point. So the thing is, if you're, comedy can make really good philosophical points, but if you take philosophy seriously, it's got its limitations <laughs> and attention. Sorry, Tom. Thanks, because my mind's reeling of the stand-up set by Derek Parfit, um, which some people... Oh, and he's got a joke. Well, what I was to say, I, <laughs> I, I have done a joke uh, about Derek Parfit uh, on very similar lines to what Piers has pointed out. And uh, you may hear it later if you turn up to the current. <laughs> but, but, but I would say, I, I agree with you that um, I think comedy primarily is about, um, well, when people are laughing at it, they're laughing at it because it's confirming their view. Um, I had experience of this. I, I actually did one of those comedy unleashed nights. Um, well, I feel like a, I feel like a prostitute when I say this. Oh, I was I was young. I needed the money. <laughs> but that was no. That was, that was, that was, I, I, so, so I did it, and I did did my usual stuff. But I was watching a lot of stuff that I didn't agree with, and it wasn't making me laugh. But at the same time, I recognised. Oh, it's it's doing all the things that comedy does there's the setups as punchlines there's act outs technically a lot of this is very good comedy i just don't happen to agree with it and um oh and coming back to what you were saying when, when you said phil k and we're talking about throwing shoes uh, perhaps it's because this was a philosophy conference but i thought you'd said foucault and so I thought I, I knew I knew he was a bit of a masochist in his private life, but a Ben Carter, that's who I didn't know. Yes, <laughs> 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 yeah. and eventually he gets to the point where um, where he was just standing up there, and it, it the point was he didn't know if the shoe was going to be thrown or not, and that's what gave it the power over him. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's, a, there's some laughs there from people who uh, remember his writings on panopticons, which is why I'm not going to do that joke later. <laughs> In the government, that either. <laughs> and just really totally understood the argument that you made because you basically said uh, so comedians would just, uh, the old comedy audience would go home and say, okay, this comedian punctured a hole in this idea, so now I agree with it in this, this reinforcement. Don't you phil philosophers do it all the time? Just write articles against each other and appear at conferences and people go to the cafeteria afterwards and saying this guy was really smart and he completely destroyed him, just like we do? I mean, isn't that a thing? Yeah, we do all the time. As philosophers, we do have worry about, uh, worries about some of our colleagues who are very witty, urbane people and kind of use that to persuade us maybe a bit too much of their views where we, we, we don't really, you know, we feel a little bit sullied by it. Uh, no names, no, no pack draw. Um, I thought you were about to say know, me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. I mean, people who, you know, they... they <laughs> We do have this sense that we want to be persuaded for the right kinds of reasons, that the arguments are good, rather than by be charmed by someone uh, or just be, be moved in our opinions. Or be made to laugh. Or be, well, yeah, I mean, that, I mean that's, that's my concern about whether comedy can be good philosophy on a different view, I mean, you know, more Wittgensteinian view of what philosophy is, more of a chance, I think, yeah. Okay, I'm going to move us on and ask just one more question, just just briefly. Um, so we had a, a another talk uh, today. In fact, it was from Julian Dodd on the stage, uh, talking about uh, focusing very much on on Woody Allen's film Manhattan. But the general question was uh, whether moral failings can make uh, comedy just less funny. I'm just wondering what what people thought about that. Question. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we, we'll 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 critique Julian's Julian's um, talk later on. But what what uh, what do you guys think about that? Well, I'll, just to reiterate what I said earlier about, I think there is a, definitely a, a distinction between the form of comedy and the content of comedy in the sense of what makes you laugh. And you can see something that has all the form of comedy, but you don't laugh because you. You just don't like the, the content. You're offended by the content. You think, no, that's just, just the wrong argument you're putting 
forward there. So, so yeah, there is there is a distinction there. And and so, but what and what about Andy? If you see something funny, and then you find out later something about the comedian's private life, mm-hmm. do you find that? Do you think? Oh, I wish I hadn't laughed so much, or it's not as funny. Do you feel? Do you ever feel like that? Uh, well, I, no, I, I feel as as a as a comedian, I'm quite glad that it's possible to create something that entertains people, even if you are a bit of a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Don't 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 sit on the fence there. Uh, any other <laughs> any other views? I mean, I I'm just just kind of reflecting. We had a few disasters in the last few years uh, in stand-up comedy. I mean, obviously we had CK and the whole masturbation in front of women thing that got him cancelled for a while, and he was coming back, and he was basically kind of struggling still to get a lot of people into his shows. Uh, but on the smaller comedy circuit, uh, we had a few things like that happen where people were completely disappeared. There were two cases that I remember. One was uh, that somebody was discovered to be a pedophile uh, in his past, like that he went to prison before he started doing comedy and he was just beginning to become a tiny little bit successful in the comedy circuit and suddenly this whole story came out and he obviously, of course, completely disappeared. Nobody even wanted to think about whether his jokes were funny anymore because we have this attitude about pedophilia that I don't want to know about that. There was another guy who was running gigs and also was... He did something, I don't know, he posted uh, a, a picture of another female comedian and he was quite duly, but also with surprising vehemence, disappeared. So the system also has a kind of a way of regulating itself. Now, whether the jokes of these guys were funnier later than they were before, they were never great, to be honest, but uh, I, don't, I don't think the joke in itself became less funny, but I think obviously the circuit has a way... Uh, of regulating itself. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but you know that was like a Black Saturday on Facebook when this thing had happened. And I can't remember the name. Do you remember the name of this guy who could completely? Anyway, uh, but the, there is it exists, and because comedy is so personal, uh, I think if you find something about a comedian's personal life that you completely horrifies you, then yeah, it's it's more difficult to consume their product if you like. <laughs> okay, but what if somebody, because I think it's, we're making our lives easy when we're saying, oh, this guy's a shit uh, comedian and that guy's a shit comedian, and they're also pedophiles, not surprisingly. But what if somebody's great? What if somebody's CK? What do we do? Well, we, we, um, we spoke about this earlier. Uh, you don't want this person to benefit economically from doing comedy. So, yeah, that's fine. Cancel them. What they're doing is appalling. You don't want to condone um, appalling behavior. And there's also sort of recency uh, to take into a, to take into account. If this person is dead, we can still, and we've got recordings of what they do, and it's uh, fantastic. That's fine. Um, just carry on appreciating that, and as a comedian, be inspired by that, and, and uh, you know, absorb those uh, techniques and and use them yourselves. That's that's fine by me. Yeah, once something, it's, it's the question of sort of ownership of once you've created something that's then out there in the world, I still listen to Morrissey, you know, but I, 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 I'll ignore any news about Morrissey because it will not be good and it will be something awful that he said. Um, but because at the time it affected me in a certain way and I, and like, like, like there's many artists I can, I can speak of about that. And I can, t- I can, I can have that nostalgia. I can almost sort of give myself uh, a, a warning before listening to or watching it of 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 this was of, of a certain time, you know the, the 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 Disney warnings that they will put, you know, before the cartoons that have dubious now moral uh, grounds. And um, I think I think as a as someone who really appreciates the craft of joke writing and of comedy. I think I can still appreciate, you know, the, the, what some what someone has done, regardless of subsequent demeanors and uh, of, of, of subsequent, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, I think of bad things that they've done, uh, but with that warning flashing in my in, in my head still, and also it, it, with the with the slight precursor to it that 
with the slight sort of warning that that, 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 that comedians are all flawed <laughs> and, and, and that they point out the flaws of humanity. And it's all, it's, it's all about the scale as well. I mean, we, we was spoken about earlier of, of that Woody Allen has not done something, has, has not committed a, uh, a criminal offence per se. He's done something morally dubious that is in itself a grey area. And of course, everything that, that Woody Allen has done is in some way about himself. And obviously, you know, the, the, the films that he's personally starring in as well. And that he is, that he plays, that he enjoys the moral ambiguity of of those of those characters as well in the, in what he creates. So yeah, I yeah, that's my thoughts on that. I think this this has not been raised whether we can live with ambiguity and with moral ambiguity and still consume culture. Can we say okay, this guy was a massive racist, but actually this music that he had written is brilliant. Wagner, uh, can we say, uh, you know, when I was a kid and my, my father was reading Mark Twain to me, he was saying, look, this language that they're using here is really racist. Nobody should use that, but it's a really interesting book. So okay, can we, uh, I think, readopt after we've thrown everything into this arena of public debate, then somehow collect it back and say, this guy was morally dubious, this creation is massively brilliant? Uh, yes. Most of the People have talked about who have been, so somebody said, morally dubious, um, are either racist or sexist in some way, or pedophiles. Supposing Rolf Harris had been done for tax fraud, would he still be performing? But there are levels of, of moral rage, and rightly so. I mean, yeah, uh, not doing your taxes is not as bad as being a pedophile. I think that's quite... So, um, um, how tatifilarious that question was. Yeah, because I mean the Archbishop, yeah, the Archbishop of Canterbury has recently been convicted of is that a speeding fraud? I, I I don't think he should be defrocked for that. Though uh, I do wish he'd sped up that coronation. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we haven't talked about tragedy comedy, and I think Dodd was an interesting example of that, really, because. He joked a lot about the tax situation and, and to some extent it put him back in the public eye after he'd been out of it for some time. But in a recent documentary, his partner said, in fact, he was deeply troubled by it and had three years of no happiness at all. And there was a certain irony uh, that the trial took place in Liverpool and I don't think Liverpool people were really uh, going to convict Ken Dodd, you know, for tax evasion. And he did manage to get away with it. But I saw him at the London Palladium shortly after this. And he had a whole string of jokes about this, about six minutes. And then suddenly the lights went down and he sang a hymn, Nearer My God to Thee. And it was an incredibly moving moment. And I think in a way it goes back to Lucy's thing about comedy and failure. Um, you know, Dodd was very aware of that. I mean, he, ultimately, he was an optimist. Happiness rather than sadness was his theme tune. But I think he was aware that, you know, you couldn't necessarily uh, as, as escape one of those things forever. Uh, thank you. You know, this pedophile act that I mentioned before, the one was on the circuit. On the same weekend that the whole of Facebook was raging around it, he came onto Facebook, that was the last time he was seen on Facebook, and he said, I really should have come clean before. I should have said what I've done. I'm now thinking that maybe this could become a really good Edinburgh show for next year. And just... <laughs> The outrage that he got for it. People were like, you're not coming to Edinburgh. You're not even getting out of your house in London because we're going to lynch you. Uh, because, but, but I think that idea that you can take what wrong you have done and turn it into art does exist and does prevail, but there are levels of offense there that should be considered, I think. Um, I was just uh, I was thinking of a comedian that I, don't, I find really hard to watch now. Someone's long dead, but Peter Sellers... When I found out about the brutality, the way that he treated people, if I try and watch a Pink Panther film where I go, look at that man being all silly and knowing it. And I think with comedy, it's quite a tricky one. In fact, Morrissey, I think, is an interesting one as well, because Morrissey was very much singing to us. These weren't just kind of abstract songs. So when you then see the narcissism uh, within him, and, and so there are certain cases, I think, you know, Sellers, I can't separate 
it, 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 it's that thing that if someone's going on stage to say, love me, love me, here's some lovely, funny things, and then you know that they're abusing people, I think that is quite a hard, I'm just going to, you know, hold. And the Louis C.K. thing, I just wanted to add something there, which is not about Louis C.K. himself, but one of the things that I found unpleasant about that case, he was dropped by everyone after it was found out. But as far as I know, everyone knew about that long before. There was a friend of mine who, when she was out in New York doing some gigs, she went, oh my God, I didn't know this about Louis C.K. Apparently lots of comics are saying, I think he's going to have to go on stage and start talking about the fact that he just keeps wanking in front of people because everyone knows. So for me, there was also the immorality of saying, well, suddenly management and producers and companies all go, oh my God, oh, this is a terrible thing. Well, they knew it was a terrible thing, but he was making them a lot of money. And I think that when you find out about those moments of silence as well, that's something that I find. And Louis C.K. is the most annoying out of all of them as well, because I think you know many of us would agree probably that Louis C.K. is undoubtedly one of the best stand-up comedians of the last kind of like, well, I mean, I think of the, of the last century. I think he's an amazing comedian. And it was like, oh, not him. You know, I'm fine not listening to Rolf Harris. It's it's not a, a major issue. Uh, Stuart Hall from It's a Knockout. You know, I wasn't watching repeats of that. But Louis C.K., it was like, oh, I really still want to find him funny. But because we make ourselves believe when we're watching comedy that that person is speaking truthfully to us very often, to know that there is a lie behind that, to know that that is a mask and a disguise, I think can make it a lot more difficult. By the way, I sacrificed myself and went to see him regardless, and he's not that funny anymore. Uh, I think I'm going to draw things to a close there, having given a damning verdict on Louis C.K. Uh, thank you all for your questions and thoughts, and we should give a big round of applause to all of our panel. Alex Dubas, Andy White, Daphne Barham, and Julian Dodd. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.